And John Fuang once noted that, and John Mudd had said, we're all the same, but we're not all the same. But then when you come right down to it, we're all the same. You can interpret this in lots of ways. But what it comes down to is we have a lot of similarities in terms of the big issues. But in terms of how those big issues get worked out, we have our individual issues. Which is why the Buddha had to have so many different ways of teaching the path. There's the Eightfold Path, there's the Seven Factors of Awakening, there are the Four Bases for Success, the Four Establishings of Mindfulness, the Five Powers, the Five the five faculties. Each of them takes the factors of the path and arranges them and approaches them in a particular way. So it's good to make note of the fact that there are these variations. But it's also good to remember there's a larger pattern. And that's why the Four Noble Truths are the Four Noble Truths. That's what's noble about them, is that they're across the board. The word ardhya means not only noble, but also standard, universal. The way suffering happens, why it happens, what can be done to put an end to it, the basic outlines are the same for everybody. And it's good to take that larger perspective every now and then. We're here focused on the present moment, but all too often what else is there in the present moment where there are our issues, our narratives from when we were younger, when we were dealing with people today, earlier this morning, our plans for tomorrow, all of our stuff, our narratives. And depending on how skillful those narratives are, they can really get us tangled up, or they can be useful. So we want to make them more skillful. One way of making them more skillful is to learn how to see them as pretty small. so they don't loom so large. This is why we spread thoughts of goodwill to all beings, compassion, empathetic joy to all beings, equanimity toward all beings, to open up the mind a little bit, to get that concept of all beings in there. This is why also the reflection on birth, aging, illness, death, separation, and the principle of karma come in two forms. One is you reflect on the fact that these things apply to you, and then you go further. You realize it's not just me, it's everybody. We're all subject to aging, illness, death, separation. We're all related through our karma. We're heirs to our karma. In other words, no matter where you go, it's the same for everybody. When I mean, you can think about it for a bit, how complicated all that is and how many different strands of karma. And you go a little bit further when the Buddha talks about how you could go through the world and it would be really hard to find someone who had never been your mother or never been your father or your brother or your sister or your son or your daughter. There's one tradition where they use that as a basis for having goodwill for all beings. But when you think about what relationships are like between parents and children, brothers and sisters, it's not all happy. And as the Buddha said, the proper response to that is to want to get out, to find release. The purpose of all these larger contemplations is to take the narratives of your life and See them in a bigger perspective. When the Buddha talks about the different kinds of speech that we are all subject to, there's kind speech and unkind speech. There's speech that's well-meaning, speech that's not that well-meaning. So there's speech that we like and speech that we don't like. That's meant to give you a larger perspective. This is the way human speech is. When you get upset about the fact, how appropriate is that? 
After all, you're not the only one who's being subjected to unpleasant speech. It's out there everywhere. I'm getting worked up about it. What does that do? It sets fire to your own mind. You can burn all kinds of goodness within you. So if you find yourself being pulled away out of this practice of being with the body in and of itself, or feelings in and of themselves, mind or mental qualities in and of themselves, if you're getting pulled out of this frame of reference and back to your daily narratives, sometimes it's good not to come straight back. Because sometimes when you come straight back, you're dragging in the issues from the narratives. Take a little detour. Think about the world as a whole, the universe as a whole. And think about some of those larger patterns, the patterns of karma, the patterns of death and rebirth. Huge cycles of time. And then you can come back to the present moment with a better perspective. This pr perspective that makes it easier to, as the Buddha says, put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Because otherwise, your concerns about the world, and particularly your world of your narratives, is going to come creeping back in again. So make use of this larger perspective. This is why the Buddha says that mindfulness practice can deal both internally and externally. And remember here that mindfulness means keeping something in mind. Being mindful of somebody else's breath, say, is not just sitting next to them and listening to their breath. It's mindful of the fact that we all have breath. To be mindful of someone else's pain. You can't feel that person's pain. But you reflect on the fact that everybody has their own pains. In fact, this is one of the things that really shows we are not all one. I can't directly feel your pains, you can't directly feel mine. And the same goes with all the aggregates. As you feel them from the inside, it's your particular sensation, your particular perceptions. And we each have our own little inner worlds like this that we have to sort out. And if we don't sort them out, what happens? Well, we just keep coming back again and rubbing up against one another again and bumping each other again. And how much longer do you want to do this? When you think of these ways, it helps you get back to the present moment with the right perspective, that you want to be here with the body in and of itself and all those other entanglements and the vines and the elastic bands that pull you and attach you to other things. You just want to cut right through them. Be here with the body in and of itself. We don't have much of a vocabulary for this in English, this experience of how the body feels from within. They call it qualia, they call it proprioception. But those are just general terms, so specific types of things we feel. This is where the Buddha is really good. He's got the elements or the properties for your experience of the body, those aggregates we chanted about just now. They may sound foreign, but they're actually things that you're doing all the time. You feel, you perceive. In other words, you put labels on things. You fabricate thoughts, you're conscious. You're aware of having a body from the inside. And it's useful to have this vocabulary to help you sense what's going on, to give you a handle of it for depersonalizing it, to see it in line with those larger patterns. When the Buddha created a catechism, a series of questions, what is one, what is two, all the way up to what is ten? for introducing basic Dharma concepts. His most interesting question, most interesting answer is one, what is one? He says, all beings subsist on food. We're all here feeding. 
This is what it means to be a being. You have to feed in order to maintain your identity as a being. And although we may dress up our food, it's not a pretty process. Just the fact that we have to exist on the lives of others, in some cases actually dead animals. And even if you're a vegetarian, you have to exist on the hard work of farmers and all the people in the supply, supply chain. It's a pretty miserable process. Again, this is one of those contemplations that's meant to make you want to gain release. So that too can bring you back into the present moment with a sense of the larger picture that makes it make more and more sense to stay right here and try to sort things out. Look at the way your mind feeds on these aggregates. You feed on your feelings. You feed on your perceptions. You create views around them, you create a strong sense of yourself around them. You create a sense of who you are based on your habits, that you do things this way, and you're better than other people because you do them that way. All this is a kind of feeding, and as the Buddha said, it's suffering. This is the essence of suffering. It's happening right here. So there's good reason to be right here, so you can see it in terms of right here, because the cure is also right here, right here in your awareness. There's, there are views, there are resolves, there are your plans to speak and act and gain your livelihood, there are the efforts you're making, there's being mindful, being concentrated on something. These are things we, go, again, we do all the time, but we don't necessarily do them in the right way. It's not like the Buddha is making up new types of activities. He's just showing us which of these activities that we're doing all the time are actually right in the terms of helping extricate ourselves from this, this perpetual feeding and feeding and feeding. So if you want to th see things clearly, this is your perspective. This is your frame of reference. Just be right here with the breath. That's your anchor in the present moment. As feelings come up, relate them to the breath. Mind states come up, relate them to the breath. Mental qualities that are skillful and unskillful, relate them to the breath. You want everything to center around here, so you don't go spinning off and creating other worlds. And you've got this perspective, this frame of reference, then you can begin to see where the real problem is. It's not out there. It's right here. We may feel that we suffer from what other people do. But what they do is just on the outer level. It's what you do with that inside as you bring it in. That's where the suffering comes from. So you try to develop the qualities inside that would help you see clearly why you're holding on to the things that are actually making you suffer. Sometimes our strongest, most resistant identity is precisely around the things that make us suffer the most. Years back, when I first came to America, I was on a plane with a John Sawat. We were coming back from an abbot's meeting. Three of us, there was John Sawat, myself, and then this man to my right in the line of seats. And he turned to us at one point. He hadn't, we hadn't said anything at all. He said, I don't suffer in my life. And seeing Buddhist monks, he probably thought, well, Buddhist monks believe that life is suffering. And he wanted to make a statement. He wasn't suffering. And they went on and on and on about his, his life, and it was pretty miserable. And it wasn't one of the cases that, okay, there's bad things in my life, but I'm not suffering from them. He was suffering. And the more he was suffering, the more he wanted to insist that he wasn't. A lot of us are like that. His son was in prison. His daughter had had a kid with a junkie. She couldn't raise the daughter. She wasn't cap she couldn't raise the, the child. So the grandparents had to raise the child, and it was you know, a cocaine baby. On top of that, they lived in Blythe, out in the middle of the desert. 
And he could tell he was miserable. But he insisted, nope, I'm not suffering. And until you can chip away at that kind of identity, there's a lot you're going to miss. There's a lot you're not going to understand. So this is what the practice requires of us, that the things that we hold to most tightly are often the things that are causing us the most suffering. And it's the only way you can pull away from that, get a larger picture, that you begin to see, okay, these things are really not worth holding on to. Maybe you'd be better off letting them go. So remember that fact that on the night of his awakening, the Buddha, in the second knowledge of the night was when he got that larger perspective on what was going on in this process of death and rebirth. It's coming back again and again and again. It was seeing the larger perspective that allowed him to see the pattern, and then he could take that pattern and apply it inside. And it was seeing inside in terms of those larger patterns, that new vocabulary. It didn't have to do with beings or me or mine. It was just these are events in the mind, these are events in the body. What do you do with them on that level? It was his ability to see things in these terms that allowed him to get free. <laughs>